Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday Night Recharge here at Santa Clarita Christian Fellowship. We're continuing in our online Bible study, and I'm so glad that you've joined us this evening or whenever you may be accessing. Let's bow before the Lord as we begin. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for allowing us to assemble, even if it's virtually, O oh God. Thank you for your mercies, because your word says we are not consumed, because your compassions fail not. They are new every morning. So, Father, we thank you this morning. We had a new mercy to go with this day. So, Father, as we open your word this evening, Lord, help us to set aside those events of this day, what may be going on around us, the anxieties we may be experiencing right now, and turn our focus to you and your word. Speak to us this day. Teach us what we need to know so that we will be better in our Christian walk, in our understanding. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This is our fifth lesson in our series entitled Handling Life's Issues. Uh, this is a second part of the lesson on confrontation. Uh, we've seen excerpts. From the prophet Elijah, some of those things that he went through, and we have seen in these last four weeks that he was a man just like the rest of us, but he was used by God. He had a prophetic office, but he was not exempt from the pressures of this life. And all of us, no matter how old we are, what our position is, in life is, where we live, we're all going to need God's direction. And when he gives us direction, guaranteed, you're going to face some opposition. It may not be to the degree that Elijah felt it with having to go against 450 prophets of Baal, but you're going to get opposition. And then we saw Elijah had to deal with depression. He was overworked. He was stressed out. Last week, we looked at confrontation, and the flip side of Elijah is Ahab, who was the king of Israel. And when we saw in 1 Kings 21, Ahab wanted a piece of ground for a vegetable garden from a man, Naboth, who was apparently his next-door neighbor at the house he had in Jezreel. And Ahab asked Naboth if he could buy the vineyard, and Naboth said, no, no, this is my father's land. This is, this is my family inheritance. I'm not going to give that to you. And Ahab went home sad, and he's pouting like a little baby. And when his wife sees him, Jezebel, she sees him, she's like, why is you the king? You exercise authority, and Ahab recounted the story as a little kid trying to you know, pout and I'm going to tell grandma what you did. And Jezebel said, listen, I, I'll fix this. And she ended up having Naboth murdered and Ahab took possession of the ground. The prophet Elijah came to Ahab and told him that his kingdom would be removed from him. He was being judged by God and that he was going to die and the dogs were going to lick up his bones. And we see there in 1 Kings 21, Ahab eventually repented. It didn't quite happen that way because of his repentance. But then he turns to Jezebel. He speaks to Ahab about Jezebel. And I don't know if you've, if you've noticed the whole time from 1 Kings 16 to the end of, of, of 1 Kings or, and even on to 2 Kings when Elijah is still on the scene. Apparently, Jezebel and Elijah never have a recorded meeting in Scripture. Elijah talks to Ahab about his wife, but never to his wife. She stayed apparently behind the scenes, but nevertheless, she was like a puppeteer orchestrating what Ahab would do. And tonight's lesson is entitled, The Spirit of Jezebel. It's alive and well. 
What, what, what lessons can we learn from Ahab? This is where we left off last week. And the last point of the lesson last week was be mindful of the company you keep. They can either lift you higher or bring you down. And we notice three groups of people here in 1 Kings 21. You have Ahab, who was wicked, but he was a weak man. His wife Jezebel was wicked just like Ahab, but she was strong. And we saw that the elders of Jezreel, who carried out Jezebel's orders, m much like a mafia hitman would carry out the Don's orders, they, they were wicked and they were subservient. Jezebel was able to accomplish her mission because Ahab was weak. What keeps the spirit of Jezebel alive is someone who remains quiet. Ahab, even though he, when she said, I'll take care of it, Ahab could have said, no, 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 honey, don't, don't, don't do that. You don't have to kill somebody over a piece of ground because Ahab knew what kind of woman she was. The elders of Jezreel could have ignored her command knowing that murder was wrong. A, a quote that's often attributed to Edmund Burke or, or John Stuart Mill from many years ago says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. That's what keeps Jezebel alive is when good people do nothing, especially in the face of evil. Look at our key verse for this evening. This is what Elijah says to Ahab about his wife. He says, and concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dog shall eat whatever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. That was a picture of judgment. But we ask the question, let, let, let's step back for a minute. Who is Jezebel? Who is Jezebel? Well, we know that she's the wife of King Ahab, who was the king of the northern kingdom. When, when Israel split under Solomon's son, Israel was divided. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel, and the southern kingdom became Judah. And when you look here, most marriages in that day were arranged marriages. And, and in this case, especially with the king, it was a, a, a political alliance because we know Jezebel is the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, which is in the surrounding region of, of Israel. And, and we see she is the one that wielded the power behind Ahab's throne. We see that she massacred the prophets of the Lord, we see that in 1 Kings 18. She orchestrated the, the murder of Naboth for his vineyard, and she was judged by God with this pro prophetic pronouncement of death by Elijah. But we, we've said this before, but we'll say it again because this is important. When we talk about Baal, and, and we said this at an earlier lesson, it says, Baal was a fertility god who was believed to enable the earth to produce crops and people to produce children. Baal worship was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. At times, appeasing Baal required human sacrifice, usually the firstborn of, one of, of the one making the sacrifice. The priests of Baal appealed to their god in rites of wild abandonment which included loud, ecstatic cries and self-inflicted injury. And we saw that in 1 Kings 18, in that confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. It hadn't rained for three and a half years, and Elijah's pronouncement, Ahab saw it as an affront to Baal. And when we look at these two individuals, Jezebel and Elijah, we see certain things. We see Jezebel hates repentance. She hates godliness. Elijah is one that demands repentance and accountability. Jezebel opposes righteousness. Elijah demands righteousness. 
Jezebel desires control. Elijah speaks for freedom of what God has to offer. Jezebel, is, as you will see, she'll appeal to pride. Elijah demands humility. Jezebel uses witchcraft and, and deceit to achieve her purpose, but Elijah is a spokesperson for God, for Yahweh. And Ahab, even though he's the king, he's just a bit player in this drama. We know who, 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 who quote unquote, wore the pants in this family. Elijah, even though he never speaks to Jezebel, their lives are in stark contrast with one another. So we're going to ask the question, ready? What is Jezebel? What is a Jezebel? And, and, and it was on TV the other day, uh, the movie by Betty Davis, and it was just named Jezebel, and, and the character Betty Davis played, even though that wasn't her name, in the movie, you know that she was a wicked, manipulative person. What, what is a Jezebel? A, a, a Jezebel is a spirit of seduction and manipulation. D don't try to just to say, well, what woman is, is fits Jezebel? I know some Je No, no. Jezebel could be a man as much as it could be a woman. But the spirit of Jezebel is a desire to de seduce and manipulate people to achieve your own purposes. It's much like saying, I know what I want, and I'm going to do what it takes to get it. It was Jezebel's influence that caused all of Israel to be pushed down into spiritual and religious corruption. She, they knew the country what to do, but somehow when Jezebel got there, you started to sink even lower. So let's kind of explain some of these things. What is seduction? To seduction, a simple dictionary definition is to, to allure or entice, particularly away from obligations or proper behavior. As the foreign wife of the king, Jezebel, quite frankly, didn't have any power in Israel. She used Ahab's power for her purposes. When we think of seduction, it's not overt. It starts off small and it builds up. Think back in Genesis 3 when the serpent came to Adam and Eve. If the serpent had said, you know, God lied to y'all, both of them would probably rebuke the serpent and it would all be done. But, but, but what did he do? He, he just started to entice. Did, did God really say that? I, you know, he's just, he just trying to keep the deep things from you. See, seduction is subtle. And it happens over time. Most people just don't fall. Off the cliff. No, no. You start backing up. Th think about in a marital relationship. You, you, you kind of get mad you don't speak to one another. Then when you don't speak to one another, if when you do start, you'll start and just, how you doing? Fine. What's going on? Nothing. And it's during that time some chicky thing, or, or, or some tall, dark, handsome would say, oh, what's wrong with you? You look so sad. And, and before you know it, it's a subtle seduction. L look at manipulation. What is manipulation? It, it, the dictionary again says it's to manage or influence skillfully, especially in an unfair manner. Another definition, it says to handle, manage, or use, especially with skill in some process of treatment or performance. The last one is, is to adapt or change, as in accounts or figures, to suit one's purposes or advantage. Manipulation works with seduction. And what does it do? It often appeals to your flesh. 
There's a sinister purpose behind manipulation. When you manipulate, you won't, just won't tell an outright lie. But you may omit the truth that might change how somebody thinks. And uh, did, did, did that happen? See, this is how we think of seduction, and I'm going to have you write this down. We don't have it just for time, but if you read the whole of Proverbs 7, especially if you read it from a modern paraphrase, this is how we most likely see seduction. And, and this is, Proverbs 7 is a picture of sexual seduction. The woman goes after this dumb young man and causes him to fall that would eventually lead to his death. Look how it says it from the New Living Translation. It says, so she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. He followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrows that would pierce his heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life, we would call him, he was just young and dumb. Well, you want to come? Oh, yeah, I'm going to come. She so is pretty. Oh. And not, not knowing that you just like an ox going to the slaughter. You, you're like a bird going to a trap. You come in stupid and, and, and end up losing your life. Seduction work because you, you're like, again, like a puppeteer. W what is a Jezebel? This is from uh, the website crosswalk.com. It says, the name Jezebel creates a visual that anyone would recognize, a woman who strives to undermine the authority of others and will use anything, even murder, to get what she wants of power, prestige, and fortune. Jezebel is known by men by many as the name representing a woman with dangerous and harmful intentions in mind who never hesitated to create the downfalls of others in order for her plans to work. She's a seductress. She knows what she wants. We may even call her nowadays ruthless. How does, how does Jezebel seduces she overemphasizes her importance you really don't have the power but you use other people's silence and indifference to your advantage you 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 like the title oh i'm chief i'm 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 the director i'm i'm so and so and you expect people to pay homage to, to that. Unfortunately, I know, I know ministers have a fit if you don't call them reverend. Oh, I worked hard for that time. No, dude. You no more anointed if they call you Cornell or if they call you Pastor Winston. It may be a sign of respect, but I don't care what you call me. Am I doing what God called me to do? I'm not important. But, but if I'm a Jesuit, I'm going to make sure you know who I am. What does that Jezebel do? She exaggerates to the extreme. There was an incident I know, an individual... He thought he was so important. He said, if I, if I le ever left this church, it would crumble and fall. No, Jesus said, I'll build this church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What was it? That was a fear tactic to make people scared to take action against his illegal and immoral activity. If I leave, no, no. How, how does Jezebel, she, she's greedy. Ahab should have been content with his own house. He may even try it on the other side of the house to, to, to try, try the neighbor on the other side to get his house if you just wanted a bigger garden. 
but he wanted just a little bit more. Be careful of people who are never satisfied. 1 Timothy 6, 10 and 11, Paul says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing in this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. How much is enough? But I will stomp on you if I'm a Jezebel to get what I need. Why? Because I, I, I need more. And the uh, look, next one is lying extremely convincingly. I'm sure when a when Jezebel went to Ahab and say, "Oh, honey, she pro- she probably rubbed his ear and, oh, honey, why are you so sad? Oh, baby king, uh, li- listen, listen, I, you the king, just just let me handle it. I, no, I'm not going anything in bed, but you know, let me go talk to Nabal. What does she do? What does she do? She Project is, projects the illusion of power. She used Ahab's power. She used his seal, his letterhead. She's living in a world of distortion. The website Got Questions says about Jezebel, it says, since it appears that Naboth had no sons, there will be no heirs, and the land would revert to the possession of the king. Such a single-minded determination to have one's way, no matter who is destroyed in the process, is a characteristic of the Jezebel spirit. I'll take what's not mine, and then she creates alliances that will benefit her. We see that with the elders in Jezreel and with the prophets of Baal. They did her dirty work. Lastly, how Jezebel seduces, it's mask in a false religiosity. Jezebel can speak religious jargon. She can quote scripture. She can use, utilize spiritual language. Oh, the, the joy of the Lord. Oh, I feel the presence of, of God. Oh, if you just do what I need. God is speaking to me. But it's not an attempt to glorify God, but it's an attempt to manipulate you. See, what does it do? It's just like how Adam and Eve had to interact with the serpent. What did the serpent do? He appealed to your flesh. He appeals to your emotions. He appeals to your pride. He appeals to your desire to belong. See, Jezebels are successful because they're able to tap into the desires that may be in your heart. That's how confidence schemes work. When you get the email that says, oh, if you... I'm from Nigeria, and I won the lottery, and I I can't get it because I'm not an American, but if I'll share 10% of my winnings with you if I could just have those that, that deposit put in your bank account. And before you know it, you say, oh, I'm just going to do a great thing. And what is it? You, you, you end up getting all your money taken. Why? Be- because they played on that emotional pull. The Apostle John said in 1 John 2, 16 and 17, John says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, there's an appeal that's there. How are we going to see Jezebel at work? Remember, he said, it's it's like a puppeteer. How how does she work in Israel? Look at 1 Kings 18, verse 21. It says, now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, 
This is Elijah speaking. And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, here it is, ready, who eat at Jezebel's table. How did, how did Jezebel get these prophets of Baal and Asherah under her control? She fed them at her table. It was a desire for their access to her power. So, hey, if you eat at my table, I, I, I can hear what you say. You, you, you're indebted to me. They, I, they needed her now for support. So, of course, they're going to do what she wants done. How, how does Jezebel work? How does she work? First Kings 20, we, we, we saw this. It says, then Jezebel, his wife. Ming of Ahab said to him, you now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, of Je the Jezreelite. I will give it to you. It wasn't hers to give. And notice how she did it. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth, she wrote the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels before him, to bear witness against him saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. And then take him out and stone him that he may die. Look what old girl, she wrote, she wrote the letters. She sealed them with his name. He's like, listen, I'm, I, I will take care of this. She told them how to get neighbor, create a, a phony banquet, ha, ha, have some lion folks come do it. She told them how to do the job. It's control over people when you can order a hit. But, but look what else happens. Look at the end of Jezebel's life in 2 Kings 9.22. It says, now it happened when Joram saw Jehu. Joram is the king of Israel after Ahab. Saw Jehu, who the prophet Elijah was told to anoint him when God speaks to him in 1 Kings 19. He said, uh, now it happened when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? So he answered, what peace? As long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. Witchcraft was forbidden in Israel and they knew it. The Mosaic law explicitly told them to avoid witchcraft. It says thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. But now the queen mother is practicing it in Israel and no one has said anything. It, but, but but what is which one? It's a work, Paul said in Galatians 5, it's a work of the flesh. You're going to let your flesh run amok. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's easy to say, oh, that was back then. That, that, that's not for the day. People don't. We, we, we're enlightened in 2020. We know more. Here it is. How Jezebel still lives. See, Jezebel, the person, may have died centuries ago, but her spirit still lives on. And we can see it in many areas, and sometimes it's masquerading as good. It's people sometimes who may do the right thing, but for the wrong reason. How does Jezebel still live? <clears throat> Pardon me. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 23. He says, What are you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Is it good to make a convert? Yes. But not if you want to mold that individual into your image. The Pharisees knew the law. They were committed to it, but they used it to control people. It's a religious spirit run amok. Have you known and heard of people that are so rigid, they can't see 
another point of view, and I'm not talking about clear directives in Scripture. No, but they want to bring you in to make you a clone of them. It's those individuals that, oh, if, if you really love Jesus, you would do what we say. I love Jesus, but I, I don't have to do what you do to prove my love for him. How, how does it still live? Look, look at Acts 15. It says, and th this is after Peter had gone to Cornelius, and the Gentiles had received Jesus, and, and it was a debate in the church. And it says, look at Acts 15, beginning at verse 5, it says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together, considered the matter. And when there had been much dispute, why? Because some folks, no, you, you couldn't be, they thought you couldn't be saved and, and still be a gent. No, no, you have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law of Moses. You, you have to essentially become Jewish. We, 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 don't want, we don't want that Gentile foolishness in our church. See, they were trying to make disciples in order to control. H how does the spirit still live? Look at, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. When we looked at 3 John, look at verse 9. It says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, to putting them out of the church. Diotrephes wants to control the church. He does it by intimidation and manipulation. If you wanted to be a member of, of this church, you needed to do what he said. And if you didn't do it, he's going to try to put you out. And, and John says later in that book, he says, I'm coming to stop his foolishness. See, the, 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 the spirit of Jezebel, you have to confront it. You have to look at how do we see it? Notice what Jesus says in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, talking to the church at Thyatira. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. And verse 23 says, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. The, Jesus himself gives the harshest com com uh, condemnation of Jezebel. He applies what the church at Thyatira was doing to what Jezebel did there in, in 1 Kings. No, no, notice there are five short descriptions that, that Jesus gives in, in verse 20. It, it says, she calls herself a prophetess. Second, she teaches. Third, she seduces. Four, she lives in rebellion. And five, it says at the end, she's going to have a turbulent life. He said, I'm going to kill her children with death. I'm going to give you according to your work. Jesus pointed out what the teaching was. She, this Jezebel was teaching that it was all right for Christians to engage in sexual immorality and idolatry because but back then in Thyatira, you had to belong to one of the unions in order to work. But part of the union meeting was that, that they would have some sexual liaisons and, and, and all kind of 
debauchery would, would be going on. And, and this woman said, well, you know what? You need a job. So, you know, it's just a booty call. It, it, it ain't real thing. But, but you know, just hang. You know, just enjoy it. And just it's, Your heart's not in it. But after all, you do need a job. You do have to work. This Jezebel, what was she doing? She was saying no, yes, to what God had said no to. What, what, what is it? Seduction and manipulation. Oh, you know, God knows your heart, and, and it's okay if you don't do it because it, it, it's okay. Look at it further. Look at it at Matthew 7, beginning as at verse 15, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. See, the, the false Looks like the real until you examine it. You know, you, you can have, you, you can go to the store, to one of the craft stores, and, and you can get some artificial apples and grapes and bananas, and if, if you're at a distance, they'll look like the real thing. And it's like, oh, oh, those are nice red apples. Oh, nice big grapes. Oh, Ooh, banana with no spots on it. But but all of a sudden, when you get closer and you pick it, say, this thing's plastic, this ain't real. See, Jesus said, false prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they, they, they're here to destroy you. See, see, they, they may be spiritual. That, oh, God is in our midst. I feel his presence. You've seen some of them spooky folks, but I will tell you, there's a difference between spiritual and being biblical. The spiritual person may be spooky, but the biblical person is grounded in the word. See, you have to be on guard. You can't let your defenses down because Jezebel is not going to come in and say, I'm a false prophet. I'm here to deceive you. I'm here to destroy you. I'm here to take everything that you hold. No, no, no. But they'll start to undermine. What, what can we learn from Jezebel? What can we learn from this person? First, we can learn that we need to beware of individuals who desire to achieve power for the sake of power. Watch out for the person that tells you if you love Jesus, you'll give the stimulus check to their ministry because we know if you love Jesus, you know you want to support the church. This individual is more concerned about missing an offering than keeping the people of God safe. And they exercise their power, their position to manipulate you. What can we learn from Jezebel? There are individuals that can be revengeful, lustful, savage, cunning, influential, murderous, and sinful. And here it is, even in the church. They love being in charge to take advantage of you, ruthless to get their way. But Jesus said, for a man to become great, you need to learn how to be a servant. The desire for power isn't killed just because you join a church. Too often see people, people see the church as a means to get to the next level of personal fulfillment. I, I, 
y'all come in here because I'm a businessman and I need to sell my stuff. So I, I, I know you want to you wanna support the church. And if you step on them, they'll shun you and try to kick you out. Thirdly, we must remain on guard against the desire to merge the world with the church. Jezebel did this successfully in Israel. Her version of God, Baal worship, became the standard in Israel. The Jezebel in Thyatira did the same thing. We've got to be careful that we don't let our politics override our theology. And we bring politics into the church and you manipulate the saints of God to achieve your political end. What can we learn from Jezebel? The company you keep and the alliances you make can be the means of your destruction. Seduction and manipulation work together with people who are in the part of going along to get along. You may be right. You may be godly. You may be upstanding. But if you are in the company of bad people, you often acquire their bad habits. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. You hang around with bad company and you'll adopt their language. You'll adopt their practices. All of a sudden, you can't worship God. You can't serve God. You can't say grace when you eat because, well, you know, they don't say grace. They, 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 they may put me out. No, no, no. Fifthly, stay alert and prayerful against the spirit of Jezebel. We can never let our guard See, deception happens when you don't know the real thing. See, I, 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 I'm going to tell you, I'm a, I'm a Pepsi man. I like my Pepsi. I like it cold. And there have been times when I'll say, bring me a Pepsi, and, and, and the restaurant brought a Coke. I'll drink it, but the taste is different. You, 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 you're trying to pull a fast one. I didn't ask for a Coke. I asked for a Pepsi. See, and it's like that. If you don't stay watchful, you'll try to go someplace and, and say, I'm trying to serve Jesus, and somebody will slip something in that's not of God. And if you're not watching See, sometimes you have to say, this got to pass the smell test. You got to, oh, 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 uh-uh, uh-uh. This evening, I had to throw some milk away out of my refrigerator because it had been there. We're not big milk drinkers, but, but I had it, and it was there. And when I opened it, 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 it looked, it was white like milk. It didn't have, it, it didn't have mold or anything. No, no, but, but what happened when I opened it, when I opened it, it ooh, this is rank. Why? Why? I had to smell it before I used it. Sometimes you need to smell some of this stuff before you grasp it. Why? Because if it's rank then, it's going to be really rank when it gets in your life. What can we learn from Jezebel? That we need to crucify those areas in your life that attempt to imitate Jezebel. I don't want that in my life. But sometimes it feels good. Sometimes I want my way. 
I'll never forget a few years ago when my wife and I, we had gone on a cruise to celebrate our 10th anniversary. And, and we had gone Caribbean and we'd gone to Ocho Rios, Jamaica, and, and we were doing what they call the Duns River Falls, and you were literally walking up this waterfall. And they told us, you have to hold hands with the person because you're going to have to help the person up because you're walking up the waterfall, not down. And, and I looked, and there was this couple that when we were on the bus going there, they, they, they were good Texas corn-fed people. And I grabbed my wife. I said, Cindy, come. I, I want to get next to him because the wife was six feet and 300. So, and, and I said, oh, ho, I, I, hey, I can pull you and she can pull me. So, so. And I, I was like, she's like, my wife was like, what? I said, no, just come with me, woman. Just, just, just come in. And we were coming in. And I was going to manipulate to get with those people. Until this little mousy man come in and he got in between us. And I'm going to tell you, I want to slap him. Why? Because I wanted my way. Now, that may be funny because it's just, it's just an excursion. It's just having fun. But what are those areas in your life that you have Jezebel in you? You want to manipulate people to get what you want done. You know, you may not murder Naboth, but, but you'll stomp on somebody because they're a peon. They can't do nothing. See, when we look at the spirit of Jezebel, when Elijah told Ahab what would happen, it wasn't pretty. But the word of God says, ready? Judgment begins at the house of God. It starts here. We talk about other people getting right. When will we get right as a church? Not, 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 not as the building, not, not as the big fellowship, but as the person of God. Scripture talks about, Paul said in Ephesians 4, put away. Put away. See, but when we put it away, we replace it with something better. And that's what God has for us, something better. We don't want Jezebel. Because she was ultimately destroyed. But we want God's best. Amen. I'll stop there. Next week, next week, we'll conclude our lessons from Elijah. And he goes into 2 Kings and he's translated into heaven. The lesson will be packing up, getting ready to go. So I encourage you, read 2 Kings. Uh, matter of fact, you can read chapters 1 and 2. It's a good story that's in there, and, and look forward to seeing you next week. As I always say, if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, please email me at cornell.h.winston at gmail.com. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for, for joining us here with, at Santa Clarita Christian Fellowship. Uh, I know we're still distancing. But God is still teaching us. We're still able to interact with one another. And we th I thank you for joining us this evening. Amen. And look forward to seeing you next week as well. Be the Lord willing. Let's bow as we conclude. Father in heaven, how we thank you. Lord, that even when we are challenged by your word that sometimes may make us feel uncomfortable, you afflict us not to cause pain, but enable us to grow, enable us to mature. Lord, enable us to be conformed to your image. So, Father, we pray this evening as we receive your word. Lord, let it not fall on stony ground or thorny ground, but let it fall on good ground and produce a crop. Lord, help us to get rid of those Jezebel tendencies 
those desires to manipulate, to seduce, to control, to have our own way. Because, Father, we don't want to emulate the world, but we want to be transformed and conformed to your image. So we pray, Father, that you would strengthen us as only you can. Lord, be with this church. Help us to continue to lift high your name. Lord, be with those that are watching, that are here, that, Lord, that may be experiencing anxiety because we can't come together. But, Lord, thank you. You still minister to us where we are. Lord, if Elijah could be in a cave and just has the birds to feed him every day, Lord, thank you. You can still feed us with your word. We can still have fellowship one with another. We can still grow in you. So, Father, help us to grasp these opportunities that you present us, not to grumble or complain, but, Lord, to say, show us this next step that we need to do. Thank you for each and every one that joined us this evening. Lord, return this time to them, to all of us again, with a better life, a productive life. We love you, we bless you, we thank you. Be with our nation, Lord, those who are in leadership. Give them wisdom. Lord, we pray for those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. We pray for those, God, that are suffering right now because of COVID. Those who are anxious, help us, God, to cast our cares on you because you truly care for us. Strengthen as only you can. Minister as only you can. Lord, help us even today to be a committee of one, to let our light so shine. Not that people could pat us on the back, but they may see you and glorify the Father which is in heaven. We thank you for this opportunity to study, to pray, to be together. Thank you for what you provided for us. We look forward to meeting again at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, God bless you. God keep you. Look forward to seeing you again. God bless you.